Hi folks, thanks for joining me here at Tridelphia Lake in Howard County, Maryland, and welcome to another installment of the Food for the Heart and Nourishment for the Soul Sabbath School Lesson Series. Our memory text this week is Hebrews 10, 14. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 14, and read along with me. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Albert Barnes' notes on the New Testament explains it clearly. The Jewish priest offered his sacrifices often, and still they did not avail to put away sin. The Savior made one sacrifice, and it was sufficient for the sins of the world. He hath perfected forever. He hath laid the foundation of the eternal perfection. The offerings is of such a character that it secures their final freedom from sin and will make them forever holy. It cannot mean that those for whom he died are made at once perfectly holy, for that is not true. But the idea is that the offering was complete and did not need to be repeated, and that it was of such a nature as entirely to remove the penalty due to sin and to lay the foundation for their final eternal holiness. The offerings made under the Jewish law were so defective that there was a necessity for repeating them every day. The offering made by the Savior was so perfect that it needed not to be repeated and that it secured the complete and final salvation of those who avail themselves of it. Those are being sanctified. Those who are made holy by that offering, it does not mean that they are as yet wholly sanctified, but that they have been brought under the influence of that gospel which sanctifies and saves. What an awesome plan God has for us. Now, if you haven't already done so, let's get our Bibles out as we study this week's lesson study, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Welcome back. Happy Sabbath and welcome to this week's Sabbath School Lesson Study number nine, entitled Jesus the Perfect Sacrifice. It's Friday, February 18, 2022 here in Hampstead, Maryland, and today was 38 degrees, mostly cloudy with really strong winds. Tomorrow on Sabbath, the high temperatures will be 41 degrees, mostly sunny and windy. Once again, it's really great to see our panel and Sabbath School class members uh, gathered here to study God's word together. How is everybody? Very good. Very good. Good. Excellent. Great. <laughs> um, how you know? It's really great to have a uh, you know our participating class members live with us now. Um, we're missing uh, one, uh, you know, do really due to uh, weather uh, that uh, blew out his uh, Wi-Fi uh, in his neighborhood and. Uh, I, I believe uh, Clayton uh, should be on a little bit later, and um, but it, it, it's really good to to have uh, you know a live uh, class members here. Um, you know, this is a big step for our program as we uh, march hopefully steadily towards the day when we'll be live streaming on multiple social media outlets uh, in the near future. Um, so, anyway, uh, for those uh, of you who that are here. Uh, uh, Carrie and uh, Alfredo, who I kind of see your elbow. Oh, there's the hand. <laughs> How have you guys been? Good. Great. Doing very good. Doing good, huh? And uh, Lawrence, you're back again, and uh, you're without your uh, your vacation background there. Uh, yes. <laughs> I didn't like the transfer of no hair to hair. So <laughs> again, again, change it up a little bit. Change it up. Again, some technical problems, which we will overcome in the future, I'm sure. Uh, um, so, um, you know, one thing, you know, I, I really didn't check this out at the before we started recording. However, uh, you can let me know. Uh, do we hear? 
the proper music for Harold Green? That's home. It's home. That's an affirmative. How have you been doing, Harold? Been doing real well this week. Yeah, you know, getting getting close close to retirement. Oh man! Uh, Trying to wrap good, things up. How good will that be? That'll be nice. I I I'm pretty sure you will not be uh, one of those people that doesn't know what to do with yourself. Uh, it'll it'll take me a while to get there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good as usual to salute you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> And uh, Ella, you're back again, and it's so good to see you. It's really great to be here. I had a really great week. Um, that storm last night was pretty crazy. I woke up around 4.30 and to some lightning and thunder, and the door was slamming. And I looked out my window, and the lightning struck the road right outside, and sparks were flying up all into the air. I was like, wow, that's different. Wow. So yeah but we had a really great week. Man, I'll tell you, I, I woke up uh, at 4.30 and tried to go back to sleep, but at five o'clock I got up and, uh, and actually processed the videos. So uh, it, it actually was a good thing. So, yep. but, but very windy, I'm telling you, there was some things the blowing around. I, you know, it's funny, I, I stopped at BJ's today and uh, a couple of the workers were running around the parking lot picking up the flyers, you know, how they have the little coupons on them and they were blowing all over the parking lot. <laughs> they were, I said, good luck with that. Uh, I don't, you're going to have a hard time with that. Uh, <laughs> it was, it, it was not good. Um, so. Rudy Beta Jr. How are you doing down in Murphy, North Carolina? That's my music, huh? That's your music. Okay. Yeah, I, that's not bad. That's not bad. Um, I, I'm thinking uh, that um, all this wild weather is caused by the, the, the full moon. Could be, yeah. That's interesting. Just, just, just a wild idea. Hmm. Yeah, well, it could it, be. It affects the ocean, so why not the weather? Sure. It's it's definitely not climate change though. So <laughs> don't pull your wallets out and give any money to the government to take care of that. <laughs> All right. Well, Rudy, you're uh, starting us off today uh, as usual. So if you could uh, have prayer for us and uh, kick off our our lesson study. All right. Let's bow our heads together. Um, our God, the great and mighty an awesome God who keeps the covenant in loving kindness. As we're gathered here uh, this evening uh, to open your word together and to study and to learn, uh, we pray your blessing upon our meeting, that it will go well. Uh, the panelists uh, will do well in their, in their discussions of these important truths in Hebrews and in uh, we're so pleased that the class members have joined us. And so we pray now, dear Father, that uh, you will help us to understand uh, and take to heart these important subjects. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I, um, since I'm leading this lesson off uh, about... Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, um, just to, to get some background uh, here, uh, you may recall, remember that just a few weeks ago, uh, we discussed the topic of the sacred covenants and how they were solemn and binding and how the Lord made such covenants with men, uh, such as Abram and also how uh, there was often a ceremony uh, for which animals were sacrificed to confirm the covenant. Uh, it was customary in, in those ancient times to sacrifice animals for various reasons. Uh, 
Uh, you also will recall that when, when the Lord established the laws for the nation of Israel, um, he instituted a system of animal sacrifices and offerings for various purposes. Uh, and just to give some examples of those, uh, the grain offering, which was an offering of gratitude for God's provisions and the sustenance of his people uh, at, at harvest time. Uh, the peace offering, which was a, a really a communal meal with friends and, and something that uh, everybody enjoyed. And then the sin offering. Uh, and that was a daily offering in which uh, people were to bring to the Lord, to the high priest, uh, an animal, usually a lamb. Um, and that animal would be sacrificed or killed and burned on the altar uh, in remission of the sins of that person who brought it. And uh, before the animal was sacrificed, the person would confess his sins on, on the head of that lamb, uh, and then it would be offered. Uh, and that was a symbol or a type of the ultimate sacrifice uh, by our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the, it's the antitype, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we're focusing on in this lesson. Uh, and so I want to have us begin in our study in the scriptures uh, by going to Ephesians chapter 3. So I invite you to turn there with me. Uh, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 21. And, and this, is a, this is a marvelous passage of scripture. The, book of the, the letter to the Ephesians is wonderful. Uh, one of my very favorite uh, books in the Bible. Uh, but these are, these are marvelous verses. And so let's read these verses and then we'll talk about them. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So I'd like to, to talk about there's so many things in this scripture, but I'd like to emphasize some of them that stood out to me. So I want to go back. Let's look back at, at verse 17 and hope that you all have your Bible so that you can turn with me. In verse 17, um, it, it talks about uh, the idea of permanency uh, here. And it talks about dwelling. Christ dwelling within us. Um, and, and notice that the, this, this is the idea of a permanent thing. Christ is not an occasional visitor who, who comes in once in a while and, and visits us and then leaves uh, unless we ask him to leave or drive him away. But he wants to dwell in our hearts. And, and so that indicates to me that that is a permanent connection or relationship between the people, between the Christians, the church, and Christ. 
And, and not only that, uh, he says that that happens through faith. Again, there in verse 17, that he can dwell in our hearts through faith. And uh, I'm going to ask maybe uh, some class members here. We have three of them. Um, to give me your definition of faith or, or if you have one. Resting assured that, that you are being carried the correct way. You're being led, um, giving yourself to, to Jesus and God to, to, to trust that, you know, what is before us and, and, and thus to me, cleansing myself of anything else that may be troubling me or helping me cleanse myself of things that are troubling. me. Good. Yeah. That's good stuff. Uh, how about panel members? Uh, you want to take a shot at that? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for. So it's really faith uh, connects the hope that we have with the reality. It also says it's the evidence of things not seen. So even though we can't see it, there's evidence of it there. That, that, that is what faith is. Good, yeah, right from the scriptures. Good definition. Um, I, um, I wrote kind of my own definition here, um, paraphrasing some scriptures. Um, and, and this is what I came up with. I said, uh, faith is a confident trust in God and his promises and is a continually sustaining principle of life. Like that. So. Um, trust. Can I uh, throw in uh, just a, a perspective I have, and, and, and maybe it's because uh, I spend a lot of time questioning my own faith, not consistently. Sometimes my faith is very strong, sometimes not so strong. And always, uh, when it's at that point, it takes me back to the story about the, uh, the, the gentleman uh, that came looking to, for Christ to heal his daughter who was, who was dying. And, and he basically uh, asked, said, uh, if you have faith, and he said, uh, you know, um, help me. I, you know, I, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Uh, so it's, it's not something, at least not in my life, it's not something that's steady and, and, and like a rock. It's something that's living. It moves. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I believe that when God uh, uh, sees my wavering faith, that he, he strengthen, strengthens it, uh, you know, with, at different times in different ways. Yeah, when that, when that person uh, made that comment or made that request to Christ, Christ was not put off by that. No. Uh, he, he, was, he recognized that the faith in that individual was weak. But there was still a measure of faith there. And, and so Christ uh, used that, even that small grain of faith that he had and performed a miracle. And, and in so doing, greatly strengthened the faith of this person. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he can do the same thing for us. Um, so going back here, I wanna go back to verse 17 again that if Christ is dwelling in our heart through faith, and, and, and Paul says that if that is the case, then you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. So those words may be able to comprehend um, tells me that the subject that we're, that's to be grasped here that he's talking about 
is beyond ordinary comprehension. We do not have the ability as weak human beings to comprehend and understand these deep truths. Uh, and, and so um, this is a supernatural thing. And then verse 19, carrying the thought further, that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. And, and we all talk about the love of Christ, and, and it's, it's an anchor for us. But, but according to what Paul says, it surpasses our knowledge. We can't really completely understand it or comprehend it. And, and I think as long as we're mortal human beings, we will not be able to fully comprehend. And then not until we get to heaven, uh, we'll be able to do so. And even then, uh, we will not have a full understanding. Okay, uh, any thoughts about, any further thoughts about this passage? So let's go to, um, I want to go to some passages in Hebrews here. Um, and, and I'm going to ask some people to help me uh, in reading some of these passages. Uh, Ella, uh, would you read for us um, Hebrews 7.27? All right. Okay. And Lawrence, uh, would you read for us Hebrews 10.10? Um, and, and so let's, let's begin with Ella in, uh, in ver chapter seven, verse 27. All right. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this, he did once for all when he offered up himself. So, uh, what, what's the main What's the main thrust of this verse, Ella? What are we learning here from this verse that's so important? That Jesus didn't need to offer sacrifices multiple times. He just did it once for everyone. Once was sufficient for everybody and for all time. Yeah. One sacrifice uh, was all encompassing. Uh, Lawrence, uh, Hebrews 10.10. 10. By that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So again, the same thought there yes. uh, is, and so the blood, the blood of our Lord, which was spilled for us, is sufficient. Exclamation mark. It is sufficient. Um, now, I want to uh, go to another passage here uh, in Hebrews 9. And so let's go back a chapter. And uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 13 here in Hebrews 9. Uh, and I'm going to go through verse 16. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify the cleansing of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. Those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. And, and just a comment about that last verse. Um, and, and to compare it to something that we can relate to, um, people make wills. They go into a lawyer's office and they, and they make a will. And that, that will expresses the, the desire of that person for the distribution of his property 
after he dies. And, and, but that will, as long as he's alive, can be changed. Uh, it's, it really is not binding. And, but so when, when Paul says that, therefore, the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood, or rather, the, the death of the one who made it is necessary, um, that's true for a will. And then if we die and we have a will, then the will becomes binding and non-changeable and is carried into effect. So it's kind of a it's kind of a crude comparison, but it's made here by the author of Hebrews uh, to help us understand. And and so um, also um, where he talks about verse fourteen. He, to cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God uh, would indicate to me that uh, men and women are redeemed for service, that the cleansing is not an end of itself. Uh, it's important, and it's, it's a necessary first step, but it doesn't end there, because this, this says that when that happens, when we are cleansed, uh, the purpose is to serve the living God. And, and so that follows through, that follows uh, of necessity. Uh, it's all part of the cleansing. It's all part of the covenant uh, that happens here, the remission of sins um, is so important. So any questions or comments about this? And if not, Ella, uh, I'm going to let you kind of pick up where I left off uh, there in Hebrews 9 and, and your part of the lesson. All right. Sounds good. All right. So in Wednesday's lesson, the cross and the cost to forgiveness. I'm actually going to jump around a little bit before we get to the verses and sort of go to the second half, I guess, of the lesson and before we get up there. So in the beginning of Mr. Rudy's lesson, he talked about the different types of sacrifices. And in the Israelite system, um, cleansing or atonement for sins occurred in two different phases. So during the year, repentant sinners could bring the different sacrifices to the temple to um, be forgiven of their sins. And this transferred the sin um, into the sanctuary to God himself. And then at the end of the year, on the day of atonement, which was the day of judgment, God would cleanse the sanctuary, clearing his judicial responsibility by taking the sins from the sanctuary to the scapegoat, which represented Satan. So this two-phase system represented the two apartments in the earthly sanctuary, which was a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. So let's go ahead and go ahead to Hebrews 9 verses 22 through 28 to read about what Christ was doing in the heavenly sanctuary. Miss um, Carrie, would you be willing to read that? Of course, my dear. <clears throat> and almost all, <laughs> and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places places made with hands, which are the fig figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. 
From then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall appear the second time without sin in, unto salvation. Thank you. Okay, so the idea of the heavenly sanctuary needs cleansing makes sense in the context of the Old Testament sanctuary. So here in these verses, it's also describing the need for the one complete final sacrifice that we were talking about before. And the sacrifice had to be God himself. It couldn't be an angel or any other lesser being. It had to be God himself, which was accomplished through Jesus, the son. Does anyone have any other comments on this passage of what Christ was doing in the heavenly sanctuary? Um, I do. <laughs> Ella? Uh, but I don't want to get us off track, but but just a kind of a sidelight uh, with regard to uh, verse 23. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Uh, it talks about cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. This verse was very helpful in, in 1844 uh, when when many believers, uh, they read the prophecy in Daniel uh, about the, uh, the 2,300 years and then the sanctuary would be cleansed. Didn't understand what that meant. And they interpreted it to mean that that was the, when Christ would leave heaven and come down and, and that would be the second coming. Uh, but that's not what it meant. And so when, when the great disappointment happened, and he didn't show up in 1844 when there were thousands of, of believers gathered there in New England uh, waiting for him to come. Uh, the great disappointment happened and many lost their way. Many Christians left the faith uh, because of that. And, and so, but, but those who were sincere and were not willing to let their faith go held on and studied deeper into the scriptures to figure out what that meant. And this verse, they came across this verse among others in, in Daniel 9, 20, I mean, sorry, in Hebrews 9, 23, which talks about the cleansing of the heavens. Mm -hmm. and, and they made the connection between the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary by the high priest when he would cleanse the sanctuary of the sins that were in it. Uh, and that was a, a spiritual cleansing. And, and Christ is doing the same thing, according to this, that he is performing the special work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, uh, which, of which the high priest was a type, the Day of Atonement. So the antitypical Day of Atonement is going on right now in the heavenly sanctuary. Just... Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to get us off track, but I just thought it was it, it was such a good story about this verse. Well, yeah, Rudy, definitely. if you look if you look at the wording of this, this must have been a, one of these moments where those who were really searching just kind of took their hand and hit themselves in the forehead and went, <laughs> "Why didn't we see this before?" Because it's pretty plain just in this verse. Uh, you know, that it's not, it wasn't uh, the anything on earth, but in, in heaven. So you can imagine when they had based everything, all their beliefs, and again, again sold all their property and everything else uh, with the, this misunderstanding that when they came across this verse, it had to be one of those head slapping moments. Yeah, yeah. And I, if you read it, actually, the whole chapter is helpful, making that connection. Uh, what what Christ is actually doing when he goes into the most holy place, which he did, we understand in 1844, he left the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and entered the most holy place where he is now ministering on our behalf and cleansing, cleansing the heavenly sanctuary of our sins. 
Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, incredible thought to think about. And just as you were speaking, I was thinking, what if that happened today? Like, would I be one of those people who would keep searching after the great disappointment? Like, that's something that, I don't know, that just came to my mind as you were thinking, like, the faith of some of those people is incredible. And it's really um, amazing. I don't know how many of you watched the movie Tell the World, where it sort of goes through that. And I love that movie. And my siblings love that movie, too. And it's just the faith of those people was really incredible. Before I move on, does anyone have any other comments? Just, uh, Ella, that uh, my understanding of prophecy, you may get the chance to find out what you'd do in that situation. Yeah. No. All right. So. Ella. Yes. We can't hear you. Can't hear. Can you hear now? Well, we can hear you, Carrie. We can't hear Alfredo. Look up. You know, one of the things that, that blows my mind, and it's so amazing to me, and it gives me great comfort, is that when you look at the whole thing, you know, when with the earthly sanctuary, the sacrifice was a lamb, an unblemished lamb, right? But the people that brought that lamb didn't have a relationship with that lamb. But Jesus, as our ultimate sacrifice, isn't it so cool that the sacrifice wants to have a relationship with us and that we can have a, we can have a relationship with him? That, to me, is the most mind-blowing thing of this whole thing. We lost him, Don. Oh, I, yeah, can, I, I can see who's going to get that microphone that I got back. <laughs> Sorry. That's it'll all right. Help, we got we got help most you of out in the in this. No, we, we we got the gist of that. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I really appreciated that. So, um, one comment that I'd like to read. So, in the Seventh Day Adventist Twenty Eight Fundamental Beliefs, um, they actually have it in the back of your Sabbath School Quarterly. If anybody's interested in looking, but in the very back, I was looking at it earlier. And number 24, Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. I just wanted to read what it had written there. It says, there is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle that the Lord set up and not humans. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to the believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. On his ascension, he was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry which was typified by the work of the high priest in the holy place of the earthly sanctuary. So the last part of the lesson is a question and it says, think of what you would face if you had to face the just punishment for your sins. How should that truth help you understand what Christ has done for you? And that was pretty I don't really want to go around and have everybody talk about how that would look like or <laughs> for them. But when I thought about that, I was like, wow. I was like, that's kind of, it's kind of scary to think about, but not really because Christ has taken that from us. So it's amazing to see all that we complain about and all that we say is so hard when really he's, he's done it all. And it's just a walk in the park from here till when we get to heaven. So there will be hard times, but God's with us and he's taken, he's taken it all. So does anyone else have any other further comments? Nope. All right. Well, then I will hand it to Mr. Harold. And I want to tell you, Ella, that you, you, you laid out a foundation for Thursday's lesson very well. Um, in fact, they, they go together real well. Uh, this description of, of, of the, the earthly sanctuary services uh, and daily and, and, and the sacrifices offered and, and the Day of Atonement, which uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary uh, is, is ideal. I'd like us to take just a moment to think about what, is, what actually took place in the earthly sanctuary 
that actually cleanse the cleanse the sanctuary. Well, maybe we could start with what? How did the sanctuary get dirty or, or need to be clean, cleansed? What what was it happened in there that need, made it need to be cleansed? So anyway. Well, when the sacrifices were offered by the priest, he would take some of the blood. And and go into the to the holy place and sprinkle that before the uh, before the curtain or the, the drape that separated that from the most holy place, and symbolically taking that sin into the sanctuary, uh, and it, and it rested there until the day of atonement. Okay. The most important point there being that when the the person put their hands on the lamb or whatever the sacrifice, they transferred their sins. To, symbolically to to the lamb it was the lamb was 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 killed the blood was taken in and sprinkled in the sanctuary in front of the uh, uh, the veil on the altar etc which transferred the sins to the sanctuary those sins were then there all right on day of atonement what what was done to cleanse it they didn't go in there with brushes and and, and soap and, and water and and, and scrub it down. What what was what was how was it cleansed? The high priest went in, and uh, and, and 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 symbolically again took the 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 sins from the sanctuary and put them on the uh, 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 the goat. And I think uh, you mentioned it, uh, Ella. That was then banished uh, and sent out. The 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 goat being uh, the um, scapegoat. Pardon. The scapegoat. The scapegoat. Right. So the then the sins were then transferred. Now, as far as the people were concerned, how what was what was happening to, in, in their life outside? Well, the what belief that their sins were taken, correct? I mean, you, you would rest assured that your sins were taken away. All right. <laughs> but there's a caution in there that if, if somebody had not uh, confessed their sins and, 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 and fully, that they would be cut off from the people. Okay. And so there's a separation of, of, of things. If somebody had was tr truly in... in Confess their sins, as you said, Lawrence. Sins were then transferred out and and and, and gone forever. You know they're gone, banished. But if they hadn't, then they then they took them on themselves back. They took them back. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and so the so the, and the point I'm making is we don't want, I don't necessarily want to dwell on all of that and the details, but there is a type of judgment going on, a decision as to you know, you had confessed your sins at one point, and the lamb was get, uh, was killed. The sins were taken to the sanctuary, and then there is a judgment as to what has happened in the meantime. What's the 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 flow of your life been like? You know, have you stayed close to God? Have you are you following Him? And so there's a judgment scene, and that's why uh, typically our our Foundation founders of the Adventist Church in, call it the investigative judgment, because there is a separation there, and and that's what takes us into judgment and the character of God, and we we uh, it's, it's very uh, crucial here. This this um, question that, that the the redemption on the cross, forgiveness of sins. All of what we uh, Ella laid out and, and what uh, Rudy had presented that, that has taken place, what does that reveal about God? And so I have a, a couple of texts I'd like somebody to read. Um, Don, we haven't heard you read one, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And um, uh, how about Rudy, if you would read uh, Romans 5, 8. And, and the question is, is what does this forgiveness and, and this process reveal us about God? Okay, Don? Okay. Uh, Romans 1, 16 uh, and 17, uh, New King James Version. For I am not ashamed 
of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right. So from what Don just read, this this process that reveals us something about God, and it, it, it reveals what? I think it was verse 17. It, it reveals the character of God, doesn't it? You know, and, and so let's keep that in mind. And then, Rudy, if, if you read uh, the, uh, the other one, Romans 5, 8. Okay. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so then it, it uh, demonstrates his love. So we have two things taking place here um, that as we, as we study it, as we look at what, what God has done for us, it, dem- it, it, it uh, reveals God's character. Remember that, that part of Satan's accusation was against the character of God. But as we study what God has done through the forgiveness, uh, uh, we, it, it, it reveals the true nature of God and who he really is. And it demonstrates his love for us. There is no question uh, on, on what we, we can see in, in this uh, as we study it. Um, the... Uh, forgiveness of sins. We uh, uh, Ella was talking about. Uh, there, there are two phases of, of, of the sanctuary process, and and we have here uh, two phases in Jesus' mediation in the two apartments. First, Jesus removed our sins, as we talked about, uh, with through the sacrifice, and carried them himself on the cross in order to provide forgiveness to everyone who believes. The second phase, phase of, of the ministry consists of judgment, the pre-advent advent judgment, which is still was still future from the point of Hebrews. But to us, at this point, we know from the study of Daniel, we could go into a whole lesson and, 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 and on, on, on the timing and, and all, all the pieces of it. But to us, it is it is it is it is current. It is happening as we speak. You know, it started in 1844. So its purpose is to show the righteousness of God and forgiving His people. Uh, in this judgment, the records of their lives will be open for the universe to see. God will show what happened in the hearts of the believers and how they embraced Jesus as their Savior and accepted His Spirit in their lives. I have a feeling as I talk to people and as observe people around all, all people, not just not in the Adventist church, but all people, many people don't like the judgment concept. And so they ignore this part of it. And, and it's so much easier to uh, and for the world to say, God is loving, and he's going to accept everyone, no matter what. But that's not what the sanctuary service teaches us, that, the, that, that there is, and, and the rest of scripture, uh, that there is a, a, a judgment uh, that, that will take place. If we look at uh, Revelation 3, uh, uh, verse 5, uh, we can also see Revelation 3, 5. Wait a minute. That doesn't look like the, that doesn't say much with relating to my, what I had. So I must have written the wrong text down. I'll have to skip it. But it, 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 Revelation 14 talks about, here's a, a, a that one would, would work better. Um, If we look at the first angel's message, uh, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and springs of water. 
So uh, the, the judgment process is, is throughout scripture. Um, and and we, we need to, to understand that. Speaking of, uh, in, in the testimonies to the church, um, volume five, Ms. White says, speaking of this judgment, our, um, man cannot meet these charges himself in his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary. His perfect obedience to God's law, even unto the death of the cross, has given him the all power in heaven and in earth, and he claims, uh, and he claims of his father's mercy and reconciliation for guilty man. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded upon our, our merits, not upon our merits, but upon his own. So I think that that paragraph lays out quite clearly that what what God is what Christ is doing for us uh, by by his his uh, uh, death on the cross and his 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 sa uh, heavenly sanctuary ministry that's going on now that he he uh, goes through and and those that have accepted him and you know uh, and and stayed built that relationship and growing through through a sanctification process uh we can be uh, go bo boldly before the throne of god because what god will the father will see is not us but but through jesus christ uh, um, because of, of we've taken him on um so uh, I think sort of set the stage for where we go from here. This uh, small paragraph from Desire of Ages, both the redeemed and unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. And that is my prayer that we can, we will continue to study the science of, of Calvary, that we will see the, the, um, God's character and his righteousness are revealed and that, and that we can uh, learn to appreciate and, and pull into our life his love. So let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the, the power that we see in, in, in your, your word as we talk, uh, talk about the, this, the perfect sacrifice that you gave to draw us back and we can see your character revealed and, and your love demonstrated to us. We thank you so much for it. And we ask that you will give us, as we talked earlier about our, our faith, that we will have the faith to follow you and go wherever and, and to guide us with, as in our unbelief and bring us the, 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 the growth of faith that we need so that we can stay close to you and follow you and, and look forward to your soon coming. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, boy. What a, you know, what a, uh, uh, just an awesome, a thrilling uh, view of, of uh, salvation for us. And, and uh, you know, it was mentioned, uh, you know, uh, during your, your part of the lesson, Harold, that, um, there's a lot of people that when that don't 
just they can't get past the idea of uh, thinking about um, their own sins, our sins, uh, basically, uh, and our responsibility and what a weight it is that Christ has taken uh, away from us. And unless we are able to do that, we can't see, you can't see the value of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, and and it's, a nece- it's a necessary pain to do. However, many mega churches have built uh, a big, uh, large treasuries uh, through people who would rather be just told, uh, you know, believe, uh, all you have to do is believe that Jesus was there and, and, and you're saved. Um, you know, it, it's a lot more than that. And, and, and these studies bring this home to us. Um, I'm, I'm just very thankful uh, for God's plan for us even before we were born. Uh, it, it, how amazing is that? Um, for, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of the, the, the teachers. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, for those of you that haven't done this before, this is, this is work. Uh, and, and while there's a blessing to be gotten from, from study, uh, it is a responsibility, and uh, you know, many of us we, we know how we feel about added responsibilities. So, uh, I just want to th- you know give credit and praise to to uh, the teachers in this group and to the end of the students who are, who are here, the class members that are here to learn uh, and are anxious uh, and clearly uh, doing some study on their own, as you can tell by their answers. So, um, you know, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for those of you that are watching this video or, or will be watching this video, uh, please, uh, we're offering you free blessings here. Uh, uh, contact us uh, on at uh, reachoutforfood at gmail.com. Let us know you want to be part of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this group and this project, and I guarantee you that you will get a blessing, that you will get countless blessings as you participate in this. Uh, even more so than just uh, studying along with us uh, in, in the video. So if you have that chance, uh, uh, just just reach out. And even if you're not interested in that, you know, you know drop us a line, uh, an email, and tell us what you think. Tell us if, you've, if you think that uh, we could be stronger in areas or if you think you like something. Um, you know, Ella, I didn't, I didn't write this down, and I'm ashamed to do this, but somewhere – on one of the websites, somebody wrote you a note, and uh, j- they were so thankful for your insight during your portion of the of the lesson uh, last week. So um, I, I don't know the specifics about it, but uh, it was somebody I didn't know, and I don't even believe was a member of our church or anything. So um, uh, the, we're 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 getting some feedback, and and uh, and there's some appreciation out there. Um, so for all of you. You know, have a happy Sabbath. Uh, you know, we're, we're it's going to be a little cool and a little breezy, but I mean, for February, not too bad. You know, we can't complain about that. And and if you have a chance uh, to uh, go to your nearest church, and uh, particularly if you live around Westminster, uh, you know, come visit us, say hi to us. Uh, um, uh, I'm sure Alfredo will be glad to to give you his autograph. Uh, if, if, if you, if you choose to ask him for it, uh, or even Lawrence. So, uh, um, everybody ha- have a happy Sabbath, uh, and, and, uh, you know, get with us next week, uh, and, and, and prepare to study for, uh, for next week's lesson with us. Uh, meanwhile, be safe and, uh, and, and enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. <laughs>